Okay. Um, hi, my name is Alberto La Torre, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Thank you for joining us for this long range colloquium organized by the Virtual Science Forum. If this is your first time joining us, I'll put later on some information about how to join our group and the efforts we lead in the chat. Let me move to our colloquium today, which will be presented by Andy McKenzie, Director of Physics of Quantum Materials at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solid in Dresden and Professor of Condensed Matter Physics at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Although today's speaker does not require an introduction, let me say a few words. Professor McKenzie has received many awards, including the Mod Medal of the Institute of Physics. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the Royal Society. And he has done a variety of extremely precise and careful experiments in condensed matter physics. His experiments have revealed new emerging phenomena in quantum materials, including novel transport regimes and new quantum critical states. Today, he will tell us about the benefits of good old fashioned crystalline perfection, new physics, and ultra pure delafacy method. Without further ado, Andy, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks very much, Alberto. And uh, thanks to everybody who organizes these kind of seminar series, which I think are extremely important uh, in the current world circumstances where so many people are stuck at home. So those of you that, that know me will realize that my voice doesn't have its usual booming qualities at the moment. I have some problem in my throat. So it's a bit of a race of, against time to see if, if my voice reaches the end of the talk. I hope it does. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is there is uh, some kind of a review of close on a decade's work that's been going on. So of course we have many uh, collaborators, uh, many of whom are listed there. Please don't read it too carefully in case I forgot someone. Um, but the real uh, main contributors to what I'm going to tell you about are first of all Xiong Hyun Kim who is completely vital because he is responsible for growing the uh, fantastic crystals that we do the work with. And then these five people who are uh, a series of absolutely fantastic graduate students that have gone through my group. So are coming, spanning now several generations. So Nabanila, Maya and Veronica are all uh, uh, doing research fellowships in the Bay Area at Stanford and Berkeley now. Philippa uh, submitted her thesis a few weeks ago, and Elena is still in the, uh, the tortuous throes of writing hers. So, uh, and so the work I'll tell you about is, is based around those five PhD theses. And, uh, and what I'll be telling you about is, uh, I want to give you an introduction to the delafossite metals. Uh, uh, and then I want to tell you about um, some of the mesoscopic experiments we've been doing in recent years on non-local transport. Then I'll tell I'll mention uh, an experiment that was published last year, which is a kind of novel quantum coherent effect that's been observed in these materials. I'll say a brief few words about why uh, they also offer tremendous opportunities for spectroscopic study. And, and then in a slight reversal of order from my abstract, I'll close by saying, okay, they've got extraordinarily high conductivity. They must have very long mean free paths for us to be able to do the experiments we do. But then the question is, why is that the case? And I'll show you how uh, we took a slightly strange way of investigating that by deliberately in introducing defects. But I've always really enjoyed material physics. And this is a, a real piece of of hard line material physics. Uh, so I think it would be quite interesting to explain to you why you take an approach like this to get this kind of information because it's surprisingly difficult as it turns out to get it by any other means. Then at the end, I'll just mention a few future prospects. So I'll, I'll mention a few, but I think there are many. So the delafossite uh, metals are absolutely not new. Actually, they were discovered in some classic uh, solid state chemistry work by the group of Shannon at the DuPont company in 19, well, published in 1971. And not only did they uh, first report many of the compounds we're gonna talk about, they also grew them in single crystal form and they knew about the very high conductivity of the materials back in 1971, but somehow the work got kind of lost and it only really got revived late 1990s and early 2000s by groups in Japan 
And then we began to work on it after that, partly in collaboration with them. So Adela Fossite, it's the, the funny name comes from Monsieur de la Fosse, who was a French crystallographer. And uh, this, the, the structure, which is classically based on copper iron O2, it's an ABO2 structure where the A site atoms for our cases are going to be platinum or palladium. And they exist in two dimensional layers on a triangular lattice. They're then interspersed with transition metal oxide layers where the transition metal atom sits in the middle of an oxygen octahedron, but that oxygen octahedron is edge sharing and it's edge sharing on its side, if you like, relative to the way it would be in a cuprate or a manganite or the perovskite structure. So uh, you get various triangular lattice metals. There are other structures, not delophosites, but they're all very similar. They differ only in the way they stack along the C axis. So for instance, sodium cobaltate, which becomes a superconductor when you um, uh, intercalate it with water, is also one of these layered triangular lattice metals. So if we look a little bit deeper, on the A site, you have your platinum or palladium. And chemically, something which is emphasized in the chemistry papers is that you have a very unusual bond, a linear metal oxygen, uh, oxygen bond. And that allows palladium and platinum to exist in a valence, which is extremely rare for those, uh, for, those, uh, for those elements, the one plus valence. And in terms of electron counting, this would be one uh, unpaired uh, electron sitting there in the D three Z squared minus R squared orbital of the four D orbitals. If we go to the uh, transition metal oct oxygen octahedra, the transition metal is always sitting in the three plus valence. And if it's cobalt, that is cobalt in the 3D6 configuration. And it sits in the low spin state. So all the T2Gs uh, are, are occupied. There's a big ga gap up to the EGs, which are unoccupied. And the material is entirely non-magnetic. There's no moment associated with the cobalt. It turns out that the, the cobalt oxide bands with this configuration of cobalt are insulating, uh, that there is a, a Hubbard U plays a role in determining the electronic structure, but they would have been band insulating anyway. That is not the case when you put in chromium instead of cobalt, because it's also three plus, but it's sitting there in the 3D3 configuration in the high spin state. So if you do just a, a simple non-magnetic band calculation, you would believe that the chromium oxide layers that uh, contained the conduction Fermi level sat in the chromium based conduction bands. That isn't what happens. There's plenty of spectroscopic and uh, uh, transport evidence that the uh, chromium layer is MUT insulating and it, it forms uh, below about 37 Kelvin, 120 degree, or at least roughly 120 degree antiferromagnet with the spin three halves that you'd expect of the high spin configuration of 3D3. Uh, either for in-plane or interplane reasons, there's quite a high frustration parameter. The vice temperature is about 500 degrees and the nail temperature a factor of 10 below that. So this MOT insulator, uh, highly conducting uh, metal type in, uh, natural heterostructure is tremendously interesting in its own right. Uh, but it would be a topic in itself. So while I'll touch on it today, I won't say much about it. And most of what we're going to talk about will be the non-magnetic uh, cobalt-based materials. So one of the reasons perhaps that the, that the DuPont group didn't follow up on the, the discovery of these metals, at least in tremendous detail, was that back in the 1970s, you really didn't have many of the techniques that we use on them regularly now, and which I think are necessary to really appreciate how, how much potential the materials hold. So as we'll see in more detail later, it's possible to do rather beautiful photo emission experiments on these materials. And that combination of photo emission and uh, Das van Alphen measurements allows us to know that either platinum cobaltate or palladium cobaltate 
have a remarkable and beautiful simplicity. You just have one half filled band crossing the Fermi level, forming a Fermi surface, which is highly faceted and looks a pretty good approximation to a hexagon. What they did know, particularly at room temperature back in the 1970s, was that these things are extremely highly conducting. So here we're, I'm showing you a graph of the room temperature conductivities of various famous elemental metals and a few of the most famously super highly conducting oxides. And you'll see there's a group at the bottom here which are too closely spaced to label on this graph. If I blow that up, uh, you'll see it includes the Ashcroft and Merman favorites like aluminum, aluminum, gold, copper, and silver. And nobody who's, who's done serious work on oxides would ever have expected uh, me metals containing the element oxygen, shall we say, to be in this group of super highly conducting uh, metals at room temperature. But it's actually even uh, more marked than that because platinum cobaltate has almost the same room temperature resistivity as copper or silver, but because it's layered, its volume carrier density is about uh, one third of that of either copper or silver. So actually, if you're going to treat this as a fair comparison, you should take account of that and lower the effective resistivity of platinum cobaltate and uh, palladium cobaltate to, to realize that by a, by a significant factor, they have the highest room temperature relaxation times of any known metals. And if somebody had told you uh, uh, 50 years ago or, or now 51 years ago that uh, triangular lattice layered oxide would, metal would be the metal that ended up holding that kind of record characteristic and that you wouldn't have been believed. Or they wouldn't have been believed. So the room temperature resistivity is already extremely low. Uh, they're incidentally very strongly anisotropic as you could see from the Fermi surface. And the resistivity is about a thousand times higher along the C axis than it is in the planes. But they also have very good resistance ratios. So that when you've taken palladium cobaltate down to very low temperatures, the low temperature resistivity is only a few nano ohm centimeters. And if you use the known Fermi surface to deduce a mean free path, that estimate is tens of microns for the best palladium cobaltate crystals. And that's to, for anybody with experience in metals at low temperatures, that's already an ex a, a very, very high number. In fact, it's so high that you could wonder, is it true? You know, are you doing, is there just something going wrong from the simplistic resistivity analysis that you were doing to tell you that you had the mean free paths of that magnitude. So in the next few uh, slides, I'm gonna show you some uh, experiments that we've done, which I believe proves without doubt that the mean free path really is that long and should be taken seriously. So the other kind of thing that we've been able to make use of, which again was absolutely not available to the DuPont guys 50 years ago, was uh, is that we want to do very high precision and very well controlled transport measurements. That's particularly important when the crystals are so conductive at low temperatures, you know, you have to put, otherwise you would have to put huge currents in to get uh, uh, easily measurable voltages from them. So what we do though, is we sculpt them down into well-defined devices. These are pseudo bulk devices. And what you're seeing here is in both of these cases, I'll show you here, I hope people can see my cursor. You can see the edge of one of Xiong Hung's crystals. That crystal has then been uh, cut into a particular shape using focus ion beam uh, lithography or sculpting. So that say for this one on the right, we can run a current in, we run it in from the top and the crystal is highly anisotropic. So we run it through a long meander to allow the current to homogenize through all the planes before we get to the active channel. Then in this particular uh, uh, device, we had eight voltage contacts on it to allow us to make four independent Hall voltage measurements and uh, various different combinations of magnetoresistance measurements. And then we run it out through an equivalent meander on the other side. So this is uh, uh, 
really relatively new way of being able to do transport and it's incredibly useful both in general and in particular on these dilophosites. So one of the first things we did when we realized that we could, uh, we could get this sculpting to work and that this time in uh, collaboration with Philip Moll, who was then still at ETH Zurich, uh, what we did is we, we uh, got some crystals together. Philip made a conducting channel in the crystal and then did a very simple experiment where the, the channel that we were looking at was beginning as being 60 microns wide. Then he narrowed it in factors of 2, 30, 15, so and so down to just below one micron. What we did was to measure the resistivity or the resistance of electron flow through that channel at every narrowing stage. I don't want to talk to you about this in too much detail because it's an old paper now and you can, you can read it at your leisure. But what we do then is we plot the channel resistivity in dimensionless units normalized to the bulk resistivity for an infinite channel width. We plot that against the uh, uh, momentum uh, relaxing the resistive mean free path divided by the, uh, the width of the channel. So it's a double dimensionless plot. And we look at, at how the data uh, evolved as a function of the variable, which was the thickness, the width of the channel that we were changing. And what we discovered was that if we used a theory for hydrodynamic electron transport, uh, that involved a very significant contribution to the scattering in the material with putative, putative momentum conserving scattering events. Then we got something like the red line and the red line matched the data rather well. Whereas a standard transport theory prediction of what was going on uh, matched the uh, observed data much less well. So from that, we concluded in 2016 that the reason the transport looked like this was because of uh, elect the viscosity of the electron fluid and that we were seeing corrections to standard transport uh, due to electron hydrodynamic effects. The story isn't that simple, <clears throat> uh, but for quite an interesting reason. When I told you that we did a standard transport theory there, we did what was available at the time, which was uh, including ballistic transport, but ballistic transport assuming a circular Fermi surface of the kind that would exist in say a doped semiconductor. Actually, we wondered about whether at the time, whether the hexagonality of our Fermi surface was going to be uh, a significant factor. Uh, it turns out that the Fermi velocity is more or less isotropic around that Fermi surface. So we slightly erroneously concluded that it wasn't going to be a big problem, um, but we still went on and checked it in some future experiments anyway. And in experiments done by Maya Bachman during her thesis, she was able to show that it's far from a negligible effect. In fact, it can be a huge effect. So if you look at the graph on the right, what you see at 100 Kelvin is that uh, which uh, you know, we're doing, showing you here the two extremes of in the same crystal running the current down a channel at 30 degrees, which is where the flow direction is the, oriented that way relative to the Fermi surface, or running it in this notation at zero degrees, where the flow direction is perpendicular to one of the Fermi surface faces. Now, uh, in a triangular lattice metal, uh, basic symmetry considerations tell you that transport has to be in-plane isotropic on a triangular lattice. So when we're up at 100 Kelvin, it's no surprise, there we've got strong phonon scattering, and we're, or phonon scattering, uh, strongly enough to make the mean free path much shorter uh, than the device size. So we're in the ohmic regime, and we see the same resistivity in, for independent of direction. However, when we go down to low temperatures and the phonon scattering dies out and we go into a non-local transport regime, what we discover is a ballistic effect, which, is, uh, uh, which makes transport along one of these two directions over twice as easy as transport of that. That's the easy direction and that's the hard direction. And it's over twice as easy to transport electrons along the easy than the hard direction. And the trouble is that 
when we interpreted the 2016 experiment without taking into account these orientation effects, we certainly built in a systematic uh, issue with the analysis. And what that means is that that 2016 experiment needs to be uh, uh, carefully repeated and re-examined, taking into account these directional effects. And that's something that we're doing uh, uh, now in the group. I think it was also though, it's, it's telling you about something quite interesting because uh, ours, was not, ours was one of a number of experiments that came out in 2016 about hydrodynamic transport. And in each of those cases, the more we as a field have thought about non-local transport beyond the Boltzmann approximation, untangling the effects of ballistic uh, as opposed to hydrodynamic transport has proved to be a, a lot more difficult than we all assumed it would be before we started trying. And so I would say that in the broadest sense, that's an example of that. I'm going to guess that by the time we've sorted this out completely, we may see some very small viscous contribution to the observations we're making, but most of it will be in the end due to ballistics. Now, uh, so the fact that this is happening at all is one confirmation that the, the very long mean free pass we I was telling you about must be true. But a much more direct one, although from a rather involved experiment that I don't think I've got time to explain to you in detail, that was done and published in 2019, again in work led by Maya Bachmann. And what she was able to show was that you had a magnetic effect called transverse electron focusing. And crudely speaking, the basic scale for seeing that transverse electron focusing should be the electron mean free path. And we could see extremely good focusing uh, uh, results when we put the contact separations as far apart as 35 microns. So if we could see these strong focusing effects with the contact tens of microns apart, then there's really no other easy way to understand that than to say that the deduction that the mean free path is itself tens of microns has to be certainly order of magnitude correct. What I'd like to do now, it's always more fun to talk about your most recent stuff and the unpublished stuff than the published stuff. So now I'll tell you about some experiments that Philippa McGuinness and Elena Jacquina have been doing in the group uh, on taking the ballistic stuff seriously and going back to repeat um, what is known from the 1990s to be something of a, a classic ballistic experiment in 2D transport. And what that involved was taking either squares or crosses where you've just brought the, the things that the diagonal uh, current uh, channels into a cross and considering what happened when you attempted to run current say from one to two and measure voltages from three to four and because the current needs to bend to go from one to two a voltage measured in this way is called a bend resistance or a bend voltage in the jargon of the field. Now, obviously, if you have a very high symmetry situation of a circular Fermi surface, then the total symmetry of your situation is going to be determined by the symmetry of your device, which would have been made either by lithography or gating or both in the semiconductor days. And if the device is a square, it would have all the symmetries of, of a square. However, when your Fermi surface is a hexagon and not a circle, then the situation you end up with is not going to have all the symmetries expected of a square. And in fact, you can define two different ones, which we call, uh, as you, for reasons you'll see in a moment, the enhanced and the diminished orientation. So in the enhanced orientation, vitally, you have a, a, a mirror symmetry line going uh, right the way through both of the diagonals. And in the diminished one, those mirror symmetry lines going along the diagonals don't exist. They've been swapped, uh, rotated by uh, uh, 45 degrees to lie along the, uh, the, the centers of the square, uh, but uh, longitudinally rather than diagonally. So we set out to see what this type of symmetry lowering would do in ballistic experiments. And we did it in the usual way. We made, uh, if you usual way if you work with a focused ion beam, we made the squares 
uh, the biggest one, Philippa and Ilina made, had a 95 micron side. And then we would sequentially uh, cut the squares down so that uh, here's this same square cut down to 25 microns. And you can basically more or less, uh, if you're careful, retain the width of the, of the current and voltage leads as you do that. So what do you see? Well, in the enhanced orientation, you see a very pronounced effect, but it's an effect which is similar to what you would have seen with a circular Fermi surface. So you're trying to do a bend resistance measurement. So you drive current in uh, these two contacts, you're trying to bend it around the corner. In the ohmic regime, uh, uh, in this square geometry, you will get a certain resistance appearing uh, uh, through the voltages three and four when you do that. And that resistance will be the same whether you run the current this way or this way, right? And, and it's exactly the same. And so whatever you do, you just get the ohmic resistance up at 100 Kelvin. Then as you go down in temperatures and enter the ballistic regime, you get into a, a position where imagine you're passing current here, then you have many states all with the Fermi velocity in the same direction. So you have a very high probability ballistically of transmitting those electrons, pumping them straight through the device to build up charge in the opposite contact. And as they build up that charge, that distorts the voltage that you would be measuring there away from ohmic, and it can even lead to the voltage going pronouncedly negative. Now that was seen in the 90s in the semiconductor devices, and we're still, and, and it doesn't really matter apart from slight deviations in uh, device perfection, whether you apply the current in that orientation or that one. However, if you do the same games in the diminished orientation, you see something similar at 100 degrees when you're ohmic, but you see something completely different at low temperatures because there the vital symmetry that made that current uh, injection orientation equivalent to that one no longer exists. So while you go negative for the voltages you see in the ballistic region uh, for one of the combat, one of the bends, one of the current orientations, in the other one you go pronouncedly positive. So you've got rather a nice uh, uh, voltage anisotropy caliper that you can use to scale the size of ballistic effects. So then you can go on and uh, make life more complicated for yourself. I'm not going to ask you to think about all the details of this stuff, but here are the two uh, uh, magnetoresistance res results for the enhanced and the diminished uh, orientation. And <clears throat> they're complicated. They contain some oscillations. Those are focusing effects very similar to our deliberate magnetic focusing experiment, and they're well understood in the old days as well as by us now. But at least you can say one thing. It's a fundamentally a measurement of the magneto resistance. So you are heartened in your mind to see that the uh, signal is even in field, right? It's symmetric as you make the field negative. Then you go to the enhanced orientation and you measure the Hall effect and you see deviations from an ohmic Hall effect, which again is what you would have expected. But you're heartened to see that that is an odd thing. It's asymmetric, anti-symmetric, sorry, in field. Then you go to the diminished orientation. And for a while, you wonder if your world has ended because you see something completely nonsensical, at least intuitively nonsensical. I'll draw that to make that point clear by taking the most extreme example of it. In the diminished orientation, you have an apparently ohmic-like Hall response at high fields. But at low fields, where the ballistic physics kicks in, you have a signal which is totally asymmetric. There's no symmetry, either odd or even with field. And the first thing you think is, my device is a disaster. And, and there was a lot of misery on the corridors when this was first seen, I think. And then you think, maybe, you know, is there something going on where time reversal has been broken here? And that's not true either. And then you uh, re-examine the old literature and you start to realize what's going on. So many of you will know of the Onsaga relations, which are used to analyze uh, ohmic transport. There are also versions of the Onsaga relations, generalized Onsaga relations, or at least one in particular, 
which still holds in the non-local transport regime. So there's a very famous paper by Butiker from uh, now 1988, where he pointed out that whatever is going on, whatever regime of transport you're in, there is one generalization which has to hold. And that says that if you reverse the current and voltage contact pairs and reverse the field, you have to see the same thing again. So that's what you get from this crazy looking Hall effect when you reverse the, the current configure, the, the pair configuration. Then you plot as the negative of the field to try and do the entire boutiquer Ansager uh, operation. And you see that absolutely perfectly the data lie on top of each other when, they, when you do that. And so what that's telling you is that, and, and Philippa has confirmed this with a very elegant landau boudicca uh, symmetry analysis based on the symmetries of our situation. It tells you that you're not breaking any fundamental symmetries there in what you're seeing, but that things can be remarkably strange when you're, when you're looking um, in low symmetry situations in fields in the ballistic regime. So all of that's in our thesis. Recently, we've realized something, which I think, again, is very nice, which is that whenever you're looking at these ballistic effects, let me go back, say, to these ones, you can go from a regime where you're big enough to be quasi-omic into the most ballistic that you're able to get, and you measure um, a, a characteristic voltage there, and you can then convert that, obviously, into a characteristic two-dimensional resistance, and then you can attempt a, uh, a, a quantitative landauer boutique estimate of the scale of those voltages and resistances that you're picking up. And it works uncannily well, except that we are operating here a landauer boutique calculation in a metal with about 12,000 quantum conductance channels instead of just a few, which is where the theory is typically used. So, you know, we get it, you can always get into linguistics about what's quantum transport and what isn't. Uh, some people would say this can all be described semi-classically because you're using sort of a kind of billiard ball approach to your ballistic trajectories. But uh, I don't think anybody would doubt that the landau boutique formalism is a properly quantum mechanical one. And the fact that we're able to do so well by using it means that I would like to claim to you that this is interesting quantum transport. Now though, with that in mind, let's move on uh, to another experiment that's been done on Delafossites recently. And actually Anton, one of the organizers is interested in this, has a theory paper from his group on the archive about this result. So what we were doing uh, was something, uh, we were attempting to do something trivially simple. We just wanted to know what the C-axis resistivity of these Delafossites was rather accurately. And anybody who's worked on the transport of layered materials knows that if you do that with bulk attempts and big contacts on bulk crystals, there are many things that can go wrong. And typically, 10 years after a new compound's come out, you know it's in plain resistivity from looking at the literature to within 10% or so. And you know it's out of plain resistivity within a factor of five, because that will be the spread of estimates that different groups are giving you. So Maya and Philip and Karsten Putzka had the idea that uh, a, a rather neat way to investigate that would be to make special devices where what we're looking at in this purple false colored uh, thing of palladium cobaltate is that the C axis is running along the bar now. So it's a series of AB planes with the C axis going this way. So if we pass the current down, we are now putting two voltage probes along that track, which is long in the C direction. So we should be able to make a pretty accurate measurement of the C axis resistance. And because we're doing it in a micro device, we have all better chances of avoiding the cracking and various other uh, tiresome things that happen to you when you try to measure C axis resistivity in bulk devices. So we did it. We measured the C axis resistivity. It was nice. But then, uh, you know, one has a field, and so one turns the field on to measure the C-axis magneto resistance as well. And when they did that, uh, this isn't the raw data, this is its uh, second derivative with field to enhance the oscillations. 
But even with the naked eye on the background magnetoresistance, we saw very pronounced oscillations. And these oscillations were periodic, not in reciprocal fields like standard quantum oscillations, but periodic in applied field. We also quickly saw that they, the frequency we were observing was width dependent. And within about two days, uh, Philip had the very smart thought that maybe, just maybe, a way to get this frequency would be, to, would be to be thinking in terms of real space flux quantization and to wonder whether that frequency had anything to do with the flux penetrating a very unusual loop, which would be the entire width of the sample, several microns, and one C-axis lattice spacing, several angstroms. And so, first of all, he had a couple of points and it looked promising, but then we looked at many, many devices where we can very precisely vary their width and we were able to show that across the, the range available to us, the dotted line is the hypothesis based on that flux uh, argument and the, the points of the data. So I think experimentally, whether the argument is microscopically significant or not, it's certainly the hypothesis works out very well in terms of the, the experiment. And the other thing to realize is that, that the biggest width we've dealt with there is about 50,000 lattice spacings. So, you know, that by any reasonable um, estimate is quasi macroscopic itself. It's a micro device, but it isn't a nano device. That's a, so what we're seeing is some kind of a quantum coherent effect there uh, persisting to quasi macroscopic length scales. And obviously a prerequisite to that is to have an extremely pure material where you don't scatter that coherence away with your disorder. Now it's always interesting when, uh, when uh, how sociology works, when you see something that as far as I know was completely new. I don't think anything like this had been seen or has been seen in any other layered material. People have very strange reactions to it. And this is one of my favorite referee uh, comments of all time. I said, well, you know, you've made an argument which you did in the paper about uh, Fraunhofer diffraction and, and uh, sort of optics argument to, to explain some of what we'd seen. So the referee then jumped onto that and said, well, it's just like a Josephson junction. So I don't see what's new here. And my good friend from next door, Roderick Mersner, one of the theorists working with us on it, said, well, nothing at all. All that we don't have is a superconductor, a junction or a Josephson effect. And in some senses, I think that's actually more than just a joke because that scales the fact that seeing these kind of things in, in metals isn't easy and, and certainly wasn't expected. And it causes you to, it challenges your understanding of uh, macroscopic uh, phenomena uh, that would be available if we had good enough materials. So the same referee as I remember then also, it was a, it was a fine report, right? That's just a bit of a joke. The referee then said uh, something else that, that really ended up improving my understanding of, of physics said, okay, you've got this uh, oscillation when the field's in the plane, but you haven't told us anything about what happens as you rotate the field away from the plane to go along the C-axis. So we did that. And what we realized is that uh, when you think about it in the right way, as I just told you, the flux quantization in the in-plane orientation of the field is if you believe my flux argument, geometrically controlled. And so it's, and it's controlled by external geometry, which is field independent. And that leads you to get, that leads to you getting an oscillatory signal, which is periodic in field. By the time you rotate the field out of the, in, uh, out of the plane along the C-axis, there will come a point when the field is big enough that the cyclotron radius of motion of the in-plane electrons uh, just like for any quantum oscillation measurement, begins to be enclosed in the cross-section of the device. So by the time you've reached that point, you're just in the basic physics like the Shubnikov to Haas effect, and the same flux quantization ideas based on a real space orbit, that is now flux quantization controlled by an area which is the square of the cyclotron radius or magnetic length and that magnetic length goes as one over B 
So the area goes as one over B squared. So there's a very neat way of seeing why if they were Aronoff Bohm oscillations, which they probably aren't, but Aronoff Bohm oscillations are periodic in field, whereas Shubnikov to Haas oscillations are periodic in reciprocal field. And very gratifyingly, when we did the experiment, we could see that in the same devices, we could see both regimes. So as we tune the field away from being in the plane, we have a whole regime of field periodic oscillations with frequencies changing due to the different components of the changing components of the field. And then when we get into very high fields and the right field angle, we get into the bulk coherence region where we get back to traditional uh, one over B uh, uh, quantized Chumnikov to Haas oscillations. And in the middle, you even see a trace where you've got both. So you're in at low fields, you're in the mesoscopic regime and at high fields, you're in the bulk regime. And as is shown there and all the way through the data, there's actually a little feature in the C-axis resistivity when you cross the dotted line and the dotted line is a, mind, a, 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 a simple estimate of the criterion for a given device where you begin to enclose the cyclotron orbit uh, in the planes. So I just felt that uh, you know, this was all completely unexpected to us. And it was one of those really fun experiments that as we went through it, uh, I felt I was learning more and more, maybe about things I should have known already, but I was learning, so I was happy. So that's the transport measurements I'd like to tell you about. Now I'd like to move on to a very, very brief discussion of, <coughs> uh, spectro of spectroscopic things that you can do with these materials. So I told you before that they're very simple. And we showed you this Fermi surface before. This is for palladium cobaltate. In energy wave vector space, it just looks so beautifully simple because there's only one band crossing the Fermi level. And the data are really extremely good. You know, you might think you'd invented this, but these are real data. It also confirms the das van Alphen result that the Fermi velocity is very high. In fact, it's not far short of the free electron velocity, even though the Fermi surface is very uh, faceted. So just before we start talking any more detail, photo emission when you've got really nice samples like this becomes a bit of a joyful thing to do as does, as it turns out, optical conductivity. I'm not showing the data for reasons of time, but you get some beautiful optical conductivity data on palladium cobaltate. And Chris Holmes, the very experienced optics guy from Brookhaven who did the experiments, he dryly pointed out to me that this was the, one of the hardest experiments he's ever done because it was the first time that his sample had a higher optical reflectivity at his range of wavelengths than his reference gold sample. So again, you just get the ideas of the unusual places in parameter space that the delphosites can take you. But then there can be much more profound physics as well. So here I repeat the EK data for palladium cobaltate. And then I show you what you get when you do the same experiment on palladium chromate. And what you see is a weak shadow band, which is, uh, you can think of it as a shadow, or you can think of it as a band Q shifted by the anti-ferromagnet, by the, by the uh, uh, wave vector of magnetism uh, in the uh, magnetic mutt layers. Now again, I'm, this you can read about uh, in detail if you're interested. There's a very long and careful argument that you have to make uh, that helps you realize that in the end, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the backfolded signal that you're seeing cannot trivially be a uh, consequence of the change of potential due to the magnetism. It ends up being, being because of coupled excitations coming with some character of the Mott layer and some character of the nearly free electron band. And it leads you to conclude in the end that you can actually measure spin susceptibilities in these circumstances using photo emission, but not needing to use spin resolve photo emission. Even ordinary, completely ordinary standard photo emission can measure your spin susceptibility. And so we were, again, very gratified uh, to, to see that. Modeling that effect has allowed us to uh, uh, quantify 
a condo lattice like Hamiltonian for this material, where the, the coupling is between the layers. And I think that that's going to prove to be very important in uh, calculations that will help understand some of the uh, strange transport properties that Elena Jacquina is able to measure during her PhD work that I don't have time to tell you about at the moment, but there's more to come there. Oops, what's happening here? The next thing to say about photo emission and, and close to the last is that uh, not just the bulk states are interesting. When you break inversion at the surfaces, you get, again, physics that completely surprised us when we saw it. You have a very clean and very, very large Rashba split uh, of your surface states. And that's surprising because the surface which is giving you this and the atoms responsible are not the heavy palladium and platinum, but the light transition metals. And in you know the best uh, piece of PhD research that uh, anybody's ever done in my group, Veronica Sunko worked out why that's happening. And, and it's, it's a speciality of the fact that these octahedra are lying on their side. Again, please go and read the paper if that interests you. I, I don't have time to go through it now. If you terminate the surface, not by the transition metal oxide layer, but by the uh, 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 palladium or platinum layers, we've got pretty good evidence that you get ferromagnetic surface states. So anyway, the point is that uh, even in the non-magnetic bulk delphosites, going and working and thinking about the surfaces can give you magnetic physics. And who knows, that may be something significant in future work, say on multilayers, for instance. Very recently, there's a paper coming out next week where Peter Val's group followed up on these uh, Rashba states by doing quasi-particle interference with them uh, in STM measurements. And they have now determined the spin selection rules for this rather unusual Rashba split state. And they've also managed to measure the spin coherence length and show that unsurprisingly, it's very long compared to spin coherence lengths that have been measured elsewhere. So Mr. Chairman, we started about what, seven minutes after the half hour. So do I have 10 more minutes to speak? Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> So this was all, even the spectroscopy in some sense is, uh, uh, is due to the, the, some, some form of extremely high sample quality. So now I'd like to go on to my favorite bit with the, uh, the materials physics, and we can ask ourselves why that, why that is. And a nice way to frame it is this paper from another group from Zhang et al. last year in Nature Materials, what they've been interested in was studying extremely high conductivity surface layers in niobium arsenide nanoflakes. And so they then did this big compendium of where do you see very uh, uh, high sheet conductivities in nature? And naturally, you see it in gallium arsenide based two decks. That's, the bit, that's because of 30 or 40 years of extremely careful material refinement research. You then see it over a, a variety of surface states in modern topological materials. And as they're arguing here, best of all in niobium arsenide. And there you're not seeing it because of crystalline purity. Uh, there's no evidence that these are particularly pure materials. You're seeing it because you have um, the same underlying physics that gives you topological responses, also gives you protection from scattering in some of these surface states. So you don't see a very strong resistive scattering rate because those scattering events are not allowed to take place. Palladium cobaltate sits right in among their results for niobium arsenide. So the question is, is that because of scattering suppression or is it because of really amazing genuine material purity? And then the, the related question is, if you're wanting to ask that, uh, the, the probe that, how can you begin? Because the mean free path suggests that we would have one in-plane defect in 100,000 atoms. Uh, and you know, how, do you, how do you take a crystal typically and decide whether it's good or not? Well, one way is to do single crystal diffraction and Horst Bormann did that for us. If we prepared the crystal extremely carefully using a fib 
to avoid it being damaged and getting lots of um, mosaic spread just from the way it was handled, then uh, you can take his word for it that these are single crystal oscillation data where he's measuring rocking curves and everything, and there's nothing at all in any of those diffraction patterns to indicate that the crystal is anything less than anything other than perfect to within the resolution of that experiment. So there's simply no chance of using x-rays to get information at this level. And you might think, go to uh, state-of-the-art scanning transmission electron microscopy. And so Celeste Chang and Dave Muller at Cornell collaborated with us to do that. And basically, you know, here Celeste has got this beautiful graph where you start out at low mag, you're not seeing any defects in the crystal. You increase the magnification, you don't see any point defects. You increase the magnification still further until you're looking at individual atomic columns and you don't even see any contrast differences at a column to column. Uh, and so within, but the resolution's not that great there. Actually for point defects, the resolution's of the order of a percent. Within that resolution of a percent, again, they simply didn't see any. And so it's below the detection limit of STEM. So what to do? So my fantastic uh, group of graduate students working together with a kind of teamwork that I haven't often seen in my group before, uh, we decided that it would be interesting to see what would happen if we deliberately put uh, defects in. And you don't wanna do that in just any way uh, because you're wanting to put point defects in. You're not wanting to get damage cascades or columnar defects the way you would for vortex physics. You want point defects. And there's basically only one place in the world at the moment where you can, where you can do that. And this is the Sirius accelerator at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And the reason it's so special is that it gives you electron irradiation with electron beam energies of up to 2.5 mega electron volts. So that's about five or six times, uh, or nearly 10 times what you would get in even a high voltage TEM. And the reason that that's so imp important is that these are very energetic, but very light particles. Rest mass is very small. So the collisions are quasi-elastic. So the amount of energy that they're able to give to the atoms is just enough to displace them, but not enough to displace them with enough energy of their own that they bash into other ones and cause cascades of damage. So you're able to create individual, what they're called Frankel pairs, which will be a vacancy plus a displaced inter interstitial atom. And they're beautifully set up to do this because they also allow you to do it at low temperatures because you don't want to anneal back in the de uh, anneal back the atom uh, into its original site again. So you stay down at low temperatures in liquid hydrogen for heat capacity reasons rather than liquid helium. And then they also allow you to be doing an in situ measurement of the resistivity as you're doing the bombardment process. So it's an ideal instrument with which to try this, um, but it's, I'm trivializing the experiment. This was an extremely difficult experiment and the uh, dedication that the guys showed through multiple visits to really get it to work and the skill they showed was extremely impressive to me. So once all of that process had gone through, this is the kind of thing they're able to see. Uh, gratifyingly, the resistivity grows with the dose and it grows with the dose at a different rate in platinum cobaltate than it does in either palladium uh, cobaltate or palladium chromate. So rather clearly the increase is dominated therefore by defects in the palladium or platinum planes. And the reason the gradients are different is it suggests that the platinum cross section would be bigger than that of palladium because it has a larger atomic number. Now, we all remember that from the Rutherford experiment and, and thinking about alpha particles and the Rutherford cross section. So then, uh, without talking to me about it, they started to think to themselves, hmm, does that mean we could do something where we could obtain the absolute cross section and turn this into a genuinely quantitative measurement? They aren't the very first to do this, but they did it themselves and uh, didn't rely on software packages. They did all the, the relevant calculations themselves. 
So the accelerator can be uh, run at different accelerating voltages from about 800 kilovolts in practical terms to two and a half megavolts. So they did a series of runs and they showed that indeed on the same sample, the rate at which you gain resistivity is energy dependent. So you plot out all of those rates uh, and you see the energy dependence they have and you do a fit through them based on scattering theory but you can't use the Rutherford cross-section because it's an approximate one, which isn't good enough for this. You have to use the full relativistic Mach cross-section. So they coded that in and they were able to do fits um, uh, under various circumstances and prove that uh, <clears throat> the, the only way to fit the data was with this particular curve and was quite sensitively and that with minimal assumptions that allows you to get back to the absolute cross-section for that scattering process. So once you've done that, you're no longer talking about dose on the axis at the bottom. You're talking about um, uh, in, induced Frankel pair concentration. And this is in 10 to the minus 3%, right? And so, so that's in parts per 100,000. And you see that the resistivity rises and these are three different compounds, many different crystals. The resistivity rises always at the same rate once you converted properly with the cross section to get the defect density. Further, you see that that rate isn't just any old rate with no adjustable parameters whatsoever. They put in the prediction for 2D unitary scattering theory and you know, it comes out possibly you know, f falsely but incredibly close to the gradient that they're measuring. So we could argue about details, but straight away, that tells you that there's no major cross section, uh, scattering cross section suppression going on in these delafossites. You know, basically, the idea here is we've put in a very modest number of defects. And as we've put those defects in in a controlled way, the resistivity has risen just as fast as it does in anything else. Right? Whereas if you, if you were to try that with surface states and a topologically protected surface state, what you would see would be that you could make it more defected, but you wouldn't change your conductivity result because the defects aren't controlling the conductivity. Here they are. And that then allows you to go one, one step further. You can take the data, say, from one crystal and you can plot it and you could see that the resistivity, this was delta rho above its as grown state. So here's the as grown state of that crystal. You extrapolate the line back and it extrapolates to zero or very close to it. So that line is then telling you what defect fraction would correspond to what resistivity, not delta resistivity, but starting resistivity as you measured it. So for that particular platinum cobalt sample, it's about five defects per 100,000 atoms, but palladium cobalt's better and a typical or typical good palladium cobalt sample has one or slightly fewer than one point defect per 100,000 atoms, just as you would have inferred from the mean free path when you started. And, uh, you know, we did that first mean free path estimate 10 years ago now. And uh, when we did it, I'd never believed that we'd have had precise experiments that allowed us to prove that that was taking place. So these are not topologically protected, at least not strongly. They are, in inverted commas, just materials that grow incredibly pure as grown with no post-growth refinement. But that's a kind of amazing thing because when you were doing it in semiconductors, you did 30 years worth of material improvement. To get to these mean free paths in graphene took developments of very ingenious sample mounting and encapsulation techniques that took about 10 years to develop. Embarrassingly, we've done nothing to improve these crystals. We grow them by liquid or vapor transport methods, and they come out of the tube as good as this, and we really don't understand why. And there again, I learned a bit about the limits of the quantum materials these days. We could make some uh, uh, statements about the scattering processes we had and the, the energies it was taking to displace the atoms on the basis of first principles calculations that a guy called Cyrus Dreyer did uh, with us, but it, nothing jumped out from those calculations to say, 
why is it that this is a material which has a particularly low propensity to defect formation? Uh, there may be a little bit there, but uh, you know, nothing, there's no killer smoking gun answer to that. So for the moment, it has to be taken as an empirical fact. And what we would love to do would be to see if we can gain insight from these delphocytes to start suggesting or growing other materials which come out of the test tube just as good. So uh, can we find other materials with the same structure that are just this pure? Well, what's for certain is there's no shortage of places to try. So here's from the conclusion chapter of Veronica's thesis. She just started looking around at what delphocytes exist. And the ones I've talked to you about today are the four, or there's three of them listed here. There's a fourth based on rhodium, which is also a metal of the same kind that we've also grown crystals of. But in this table, when you include sulfides, selenides and tellurides and nitri as well as oxides, we haven't even listed nitrides. There are several hundred other co um, combinations. Almost none of them are metals, but some of them are relatively low gap insulators and many of them have interesting magnetic textures. So one of the things that our group is gonna be doing uh, in the next few years is to be trying to grow more materials from this materials class and then find ways of characterizing them to try and pick up on what their true defect level is to see if there's really some special magic and there are new classes of ultra pure materials that could even be wide gap semiconductors out there to find. So that's all I wanted to say to you today. I think I've just about kept to my time. The summary's there. Uh, the uh, outlook would be uh, to try and understand what, uh, what's, what, what we've got, why are we getting these long mean free paths? I don't think we've finished the quest uh, which is underway to uh, take advantage of the properties they offer us. But then in the longer term still, it's great to see that several groups around the world have now picked up the baton of trying to use thin film techniques here to grow these uh, crystalline epitaxial delphocytes and move us towards where we could start going from natural gift heterostructures to artificially grown ones. Because if we could grow them, then we could create interfaces and we might be able to take um, advantage of the amazing uh, properties that we've shown that can exist at some of those surfaces. So my voice has just about made it. Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Andy, for a beautiful talk. Um, let me open the, the call for questions. I think Babak has a question to please. Oh, go ahead. Yes, thank you for a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, one one sort of question about the uh, the structures that you see. The Fermi surface seems very nested, so I would have expected to see some kind of ordering at low temperature. Indeed, and, well, indeed. Uh, and we, empirically, you know, we, there is no evidence for it, right? Um, you know, there's no sign that there's a gapping transition taking place. I now there's an interesting. <laughs> Interesting or maybe not interesting, people, pe people argue about this. I have an unproven hunch that incommensurability may be playing a role. I see. Because uh, you, this is a half-filled band, but the half-filling half filling in the triangular lattice is an incommensurate filling. Mm -hmm. So if a density wave was to happen, it would have to be incommensurate. That doesn't necessarily, t that's, a, that's a hunch rather than a proper physical argument, but it's the best I can do. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm done. Yep, you. thanks. All right, thanks uh, for the talk. Uh, quite, quite a lot of interesting information. Uh, so I was wondering about the chromium material. Yeah. Uh, is is there anything known about the spin dynamics or magnetization dynamics in this in the system, like magnon transport or anything like that? Uh, not not enough. Um, 
Uh, and so, uh, but we do have, uh, we had a kind of COVID delayed plan to do some inelastic neutron scattering on it. And, uh, and that again, you know, these, I tell you, these students are just so incredible. So uh, Elena has mounted and aligned one of these huge mosaics of, uh, platinum, of palladium chromate uh, crystals for that experiment, because to get the mass to do an inelastic experiment, the crystals we grow are relatively small. So uh, either has mounted or has nearly finished mounting. There's a thesis to write. Um, but, but yeah, we, we very much want to look at that. Thanks. Um, also, another question. Um, in the end, in your outlook, you mentioned uh, you mentioned epidactyl growth, or uh, so. So I I thought that this was a major technological challenge that it just didn't work. Or is there is there some hope that it can succeed? Oh, I I think um, when you look at the history of attempting to grow any oxide, any material at very high purity with thin films, that's never easy. And, and it often takes a long time. And one of the, the major um, barriers, I think, is that if you've got a, a, a technologically accepted, very important problem, then crystal growth companies will begin to grow and refine and sell you exactly the substrates that you need. Right? And so for cuprates, for instance, that's been done in manganites. You can just say, I need this substrate to achieve epitaxy, but they're all square lattice materials. So finding the triangular lattice substrates is not so easy here. And, uh, and you know, true epitaxy will only be achieved once that's been done. Now, I, I'm now reading papers by a few groups who are doing uh, very sensible things which is that the natural thing to do is to grow very small substrates in the form of insulating crystals of other delophosites, right? Because that, that's gonna be your, one of your better starting points. Um, but, you know, in the cuprates, really high quality films took 15 years with huge effort. And the effort here is going on with a far more, they're very good groups, but it's a much more restricted number of groups who are trying it. So I, I don't believe that it's impossible. Um, and, you know, okay, in strontium ruthenate, the, the very high purity superconductor I'm interested in, we now, 26 years after superconductivity was discovered in crystals, have one group in the world who can really reliably make superconducting films, right? And so, you know, uh, things can feel impossible, but they aren't necessarily impossible. But I'm right, glad it's thanks. not me. <laughs> <clears throat> Raise yes, Can you yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for your beautiful talk. I have a question. You mentioned this rush bar splitting on the surface. Um, I, I think I'm seeing another band that has a circular firm surface instead of a hexagonal firm surface. Yeah, but, uh, but those are the two rush bar split bands. So let me, I was very quick there. Let me just. So the, the contrast has been played with here. Uh, actually, what you really see in these things is a very faint uh, bulk band as well, right? Bulk, bulk Fermi surface too. I don't expect you to be able to see it, but it is there. And that's because the intensity that you get typically from a surface state can often be much higher than the intensity you get from bulk states. In fact, people go to certain efforts to get rid of the surface states in order to really study the bulk physics a lot of the time. So those are the two Fermi surfaces of surface states. And uh, we, uh, we, I mean, Phil and Veronica, Phil King and Veronica Sunko and collaborators did some spin resolved photo mission to confirm that the spin orientation is opposite on the inner and outer state. Right? And the thing that, uh, that uh, Veronica worked out, which is amazing here is that when, when you get giant, you, you, everybody knows in inverted commas that giant Rashba states, uh, giant Rashba splittings happen in very heavy materials with huge atomic spin orbit coupling scales, right? But actually that's happening because what limits the Rashba split that you observe is the lesser of the inversion breaking scale and the Rashba scale. 
And because these delophosite transition metal oxide surfaces, the octahedra lie on the edge, the cobalt cobalt hopping for, that's creating this state goes through one oxygen which is above the cobalt and another one which is below. Right, and that orientation wouldn't happen to you in a perovskite where both those paths were in plane. And that means that if you've got a surface there, the energetic difference between those two paths becomes huge. And, you know, um, DFT sees it in a slab calculation, but Veronica also calculated it specifically in tight binding models to prove that it was what was happening. So it means the inversion breaking scale is enormous. So you're completely limited by the atomic spin orbit coupling scale. But the atomic spin orbit coupling of, of cobalt is of order, you know, 50 to 70 millivolts. And that's what the end of that corresponds to just that energetic difference. Right. And uh, after a referee queried the model, um, we grew palladium rhodate, where rhodium has got a far bigger bare scale because it's a 4D metal, and studied the surface state uh, Rashba split in that. And it completely conforms to our expectation. You get about 150 millivolt Rashba split for palladium rhodate and a 70 millivolt one for palladium cobalt. -8. So, so, so there's no magic here, but it's telling you that there are, if you, the, the way you've intuited this physics wasn't completely correct and that there are special structures that, that, that give you a much bigger effect than you expected to see. I see. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, but uh, I see Arvind has the right hand. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had a question about uh, yeah about the surface state also. So on a macroscopic crystal, if you find some, you know, maybe some area that has this ter the appropriate termination, could you, in principle, make a FIB device and even look for some transport signature like the very phase in the quantum oscillations or something? Is that something that could be done? I, I mean, this is this is a photo emission experiment which is uh, done by cleaving under high vacuum. So you take the sample out to try and do any other experiment on it, and you would have dirtied away your surface state, I think. That's what we, we reckon. So I would say, uh, so, you know, now, in the future, can one ever imagine having um, a joint system, which is like a photo emission stage, and then a transfer system under high vacuum to a focused ion beam? There's nothing really to say you couldn't do it. Right, people put STMs and uh, 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 and photo emission sources together now. So what you're saying would be possible in principle, but not with any technology that we have access to. Or maybe at the back surface of like an epitaxial film or something. I yeah, know. I mean, I mean, I think that the way to try and do it is to do it at interfaces. Once you've understood what the physics is, if you can get the 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 the, the heterostructure and going. Then you could design an interface that uh, where you built in a lot of inversion breaking, and and then you know you've got the thing buried anyway, so you you could then start to play these kind of games on that. Yeah, that's, that's very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about this, uh, uh, you know, re much reduced propensity of defect form for defect formation. Yeah. And so what you've done is very controlled way of introducing defects. Um, can you do maybe much or not much, somewhat less controlled way of introducing defects and seeing what is really say the energy barrier or whatever it is that is keeping uh, the density of defects low? I think I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I wonder how we would try and do that. Um, I, one thing I didn't tell you in this is that one of the reasons that you, um, one of the reasons that you do a lot of the resistivity measurements at low temperatures, in these type of uh, accelerators, is that if you're unlucky, uh, you take your sample back up to room temperature to take it out of the cryostat and it's entirely annealed itself back to perfection again. Right. Now, in these materials, you, you keep about, oh, I'm trying to remember, it's about 
of the extra resistivity that you created. So some of it does anneal back out by the time you get up to room temperature. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they did, uh, you know, because I say they, you know, I'm, I'm the boss, but this was all their own planning. They did uh, very careful long-term annealing cycles up to about 450 centigrade. And they established that there are two kinetic thresholds of recombination that you pass when you do that. I the see. trouble is that that type of stuff is kinetics as well as, right. as just defect, defect energetics. So, um, I mean, there's a, Cyrus Dreyer is a, is a big expert in this because uh, nowadays, now when you think you're doing quantum commutation, one of the things that people really want to understand are what are defect formation energies in semiconductors for various ions that you might want to put or defects you might want to, to put in to, to make circuits with them. And so, uh, you know, people are really trying very hard to establish that kind of knowledge. But what was also extremely interesting to me was that as we talked with him, you realize where there's a huge challenge for, for the future because he was needing from us, he was trying to calculate the free energy of formation of the material from scratch in some senses. That's the dream to be able to do. And he then has a series of very natural questions for the guys, who, like us who drew the crystals of, you know, what was the pressure at that temperature, you know, just completely basic things. And we actually don't know any of them, right? Because the way these crystals get grown similar to everything else is you throw powder in a tube, you heat it up yeah. due to the experience and, and knowledge of somebody. And, uh, you know, you there's all sorts of black magic about one end of the tube is one temperature, the other ends are colder temperature. So you transport the vapor across. And we're lucky because we have, you know, one of the world's uh, most experienced vapor transport guys in one of our chemistry departments. So he gave us a huge amount of help and tips, particularly on how to grow platinum cobaltate. Um, but that's still a lifetime of experience. It's not really serious measurement. And I, I think that, yeah, at the level of starting an institute with a big new idea, uh, starting a, a very serious 20 year experimental effort to develop all the techniques and assays that you would need to fully characterize that growth process while you're doing it, and then have a second department in the Institute of the theorists making use of that information, that would be a way we could make progress. You know, and if I was a young man, I would actually quite like that. I think that would be really worthy but it's it's you know it's the type of research that's not going to get done in ten minutes by somebody. Of course, <laughs> right, right. But some of the yeah. young people here, that's a really serious. You know, uh, it's not often that I see something because I kind of just work from minute to minute. You know, we we work on play around and try and understand what we've done. It's not often that I get involved in something where the penny drops and I think, no, yeah, there is something you could write a strategy about. <clears throat> Very interesting. Thank you. Stephen, I think you have. Yeah, if I could, I, I'm a mathematician with an interest in materials, so I'm somewhat deficient in my knowledge of, you know, experimental systems. So this question may not fit. I'm interested in surface faceting. So when you, when you think of these surface states, if, if I think these perfect crystals, if you cleave them, yeah in thermodynamically unstable orientations, then they're going to essentially decompose, I presume, into nanofaceted type structures. Is there any interesting material science or physics to the interplay between surface faceting and these types of phenomena? Well, I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, when, when, when somebody from an STM group shows you a beautiful picture like that, that has been chosen from a particular area of the surface where when you cleaved it, you didn't end up with surface step edges and surface facets. Oh, fabulous. I didn't, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, actually in this paper, which is uh, coming out next week, they also made use of this. They set up quantum interference of standing waves between two step edges, right? Or set up, they observed it, right? They found that. So, so um, and, and this is, widely done uh, by uh, STM people. There is also um, on the chemistry side particular, now the trouble is that these melting temperatures are pretty high 
So you, you're not usually at a, at a kinetic state where you're seeing these things happening in real time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas people do look at uh, self-organization of molecules on surface surfaces now in real time using STMs. But no, definitely when you, these crystals, they're horrible cleavers, right? They don't cleave very nicely at all because they're pretty strongly bonded along the C-axis. So you certainly see faceting all over the place. And actually, again, uh, to be honest about the photo emission, uh, we have no, you know, the, the question about would you be able then to fib, to fib isolate the area that gave you this rash per state? Well, with a lot of work, but the way you find it is you scan across the surface forever until you've got a, a bit which is big enough to give you a single response uh, over the the width over the diameter of your beam. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time uh, in the real experiments, they were seeing spectra which were hybrids of cobalt termination and platinum or, or palladium termination, and just getting all the information at once, which isn't so pretty for the for the pictures in your paper. Right, but that tells you that you know this is a very uncontrolled process. You're ripping the thing apart, and not only would you be getting the equivalent of facets, the way the different subsurfaces terminate isn't always the same. Well, if, if I could, then maybe the, the second question would be: I'm interested in studying the evolution of the surface texture of surface faceting. So that itself, that cleaving doesn't lead to a final state. There's an evolving texture generally it's yeah but but what i'm what i'm thinking is that the bonds are pretty strong mm -hmm. and 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 so these are high melting point relatively high melting point materials so the actual mobility of structures on the surface oh. at room temperature the kinetic barrier is huge oh, so the these, are, these ones are essentially static uh -huh. so you'd be wanting to look at um Oh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a video of somebody crystallizing gallium, for instance. No. That's oh, amazing, right? I, I know somebody, if you send me your email address, okay. I'll get her to send you that video. So gallium melts at just above room temperature. So basically, you know, it's, it's, you've got it on some surface, you've put the, the, the surface on your hand, the gallium is liquid, put it down on a table, and the stuff begins to crystallize. And there you've got all of that kinetics that you're seeing in real time. Yeah, because the other question is, again, it's not something I understand enough of the math model of to be sure I'm asking a good question, but this spin texture that you referred to, <clears throat> uh, I guess I'd be interested in what's understood about that and what are the models one needs to study to, uh, to, to sort of say interesting yeah, um, things. So I believe that things are pretty nicely explained in that paper. So you might want to have a look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a spin texture in K space. So, uh, so this is momentum space. So it's, it's not so easy to think about it in, in a really easy real space way. Um, but no, it sounds to me, so where are you? I mean, I can tell you, Scott. University, University of Glasgow. Right, so Peter Val is in St. Andrews. This is St. Andrews yeah. data. So I would say you would be pretty interested in getting in touch with Peter and going over and talking to them about yes, what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, I did, I did detect the accents intersected. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this one's filtered through a few years in the States though, so not exactly authentic. Yeah, my, my, mine too, so. <laughs> yeah. Super, thanks. I'll write to you for that video as well. Yeah, perfect, please do.